Warm welcome to yet another biography event. My name is Kai Bird, and I'm the director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography, a wholly unique institution hosted by the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, and founded by Shelby White and the Leon Levy Foundation in the year 2007. I want to thank Shelby in particular for her steadfast support to the Biography Center. It is her vision that makes this program possible. Please note that our next event will take place on April 13th, the Wednesday at 7.30 next week, when the historian Michael Kazin will interview Lisa Miller and Rebecca Traster about their biographical treatment of Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. The book is called Take Up Space, the Unprecedented AOC. Please mark your calendars and register for this event on the Leon Levy website. And please encourage your friends and relatives to subscribe to our digital mailing list, uh, which you can do on the website as well. But tonight we are gathered to celebrate the publication of an unusual memoir about the Iranian revolution. The author is Neda Tuli Semnani, and the book is They Said They Wanted Revolution, a memoir of my parents. She will be interviewed by Jason Razayan, a Washington Post reporter. I have to say that I have a personal interest in this topic, if only because as a young reporter in my late 20s, I once spent three weeks in Tehran just after the revolution. It was a chaotic and colorful moment in time, and I think we are all still living with the consequences of these historic events. Neda Tulid Semnani is an Emmy award-winning writer and producer. She is currently a senior writer at the television news magazine, Vice News Tonight, and her work has appeared in numerous publications, including the Washington Post, Kinfolk, New York, the Los Angeles Review of Books, The Baffler, The Week, Buzzweed, and Roll Call, among others. Jason Razayan is a award-winning journalist who is currently global opinions columnist for the Washington Post, writing primarily on international affairs, press freedom, and human rights issues. Formerly the Washington Post Tehran bureau chief, he is the host of 544 Days, the acclaimed Spotify original podcast series based on his 2019 best-selling memoir, Prisoner about his time as a hostage in Iran and the extraordinary efforts it took to free him. Please look for all these books at bookshops.org, a site that will lead you to your local independent bookstore. Our panelists will be in conversation for about 45 or 50 minutes, and then we will take questions from our virtual audience. Please click on, click on the question box below to type in your questions, and Jason will be sure to get to as many as he can. We will try to end this program after about one hour. Again, thanks to Shelby White and the Leon Levy Foundation for funding this and all our other events. And now I turn this conversation over to Jason Razayan. Thank you, Jason. Thank you so much, Kai. Thanks for the introduction. I wanna thank uh, the, the Levy Center for putting this on and everybody for joining us tonight. Um, it's a really special opportunity for me um, I heard about, uh, they said they wanted revolution, uh, directly from Neda some months ago. I don't think we'd ever met before, um, or corresponded. Um, but we, we started, a uh, intermittent e email correspondence. And then maybe six or eight weeks ago, we had a conversation on, on the phone when she asked me to take part in this event. Um, and just out of um, sheer, I think, uh, kismet, or kismet, as we say in Persian, um, I was in San Francisco, my hometown, uh, to do a, an event at the World Affairs Council there. And a gentleman attended uh, that event and gave me this copy uh, of the book. A friend of yours, Parviz. Um, and um, I had a digital copy of it that you had given to me, but but it was you know it's always different to hold it in your hands. Um, the book is remarkable in a lot of ways. It tells a very 
a uh, painful family story, um, but one that I think is uh, unique in many ways, but also has so many parallels for others in the Iranian diaspora community. Um, and, and the first thing I wanted to talk about, Neda, was um, how you decided to go about building your narrative structure. Um, I will tell readers that uh, that it's you know non-linear, non-sequential in, in parts. Um, my own memoir I chose to do in in a, a similar fashion, uh, not exactly the same, of course, but um, you know moving across time and space, uh, location, um, and and I, I wonder if you could uh, just kind of give us a sense of how you came to that decision and what it was like to construct this, this narrative. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Kai. Thank you, Ben and, um, and the Levy Center for having us. Um, we, I s spent a lot of years um, obviously reporting this book and working on this book. Um, I think part of that uh, was figuring out how to write the book. And one of the things that I settled on finally, after many, many years, is claiming the story as my own. Um, and the way, and what that meant is, I think as a journalist, for good reasons, you you tell the story most of the time chronologically. And if you don't do that, it's for a specific reason. Um, and so one of the reasons why I decided to really lean into what we call a braided narrative, and this is like a pretty tightly braided narrative, um, and it changes as uh, as the 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 arc of the story goes on, um, it's because it felt true to how we tell stories. Um, and one of the, I worked really, really, really hard on making it seem, and hopefully this worked, the reader feel like I was sitting next to them. And you know that feeling that you get when you play just met somebody and you guys are just getting along really well and you're in those early stages of getting to know them when you're hearing their story. Um, those stories don't happen in a linear fashion. Nobody starts saying like, and I was, you know, in the David Copperfield way, I was born and then all these other things happen. You start telling them kind of how, the, how you became who you became. And so this story is in three parts. You have the pretty, you know, straight ahead journalism that is at the start, even though you're right, it goes back and forth between time and space, but it's still like an adult Netta who has done research, does her, done her journalism and written down the story as far as she can know it. Then you have the second part, which is immersive journalism. The story, the sentences get shorter, the details, you know, hopefully are a little bit more, um, you know, teased out, the colors should pop, those type of details because that was once I was born. And as a child, when you're going through things, your experience of the world tends to be nonverbal. It tends to be very much immersed. Like you can't quite explain all the things that you feel. And then the third part is this, um, you watch me as a child kind of grow up through diaries and letters. Um, and then the other thing that felt really important that I think it's important to say is I try to include um, my parents' words when I could. And so it's not just a braided narrative. This makes it all sound kind of more complicated than it is, but hopefully people's voices were also represented. So what becomes clear is that this is the story of many people, but I have, you know, put it together um, kind of through my, through the filter that is me. If that makes sense. Um, I, I, pulled a quote that, that I'd like you to read that I think really explains it for people who haven't read the book yet. And if you would, it would be great if you'd read that. Sure. Um, so this is um, towards the end of the book. Um, it's, it is the end of the book, I suppose, before the epilogue. Um, <clears throat> it is a story a story about people who moved between places and through time. It is about the past, about journeys I stitched together scrap by scrap until the present came through. I wove them into a story, a story I made from wisps gathered from here and there, wisps 
threaded through an eye, pierced into a seam, leading from then until later. It might explain how now is. It might explain today's song. I love that. It's fantastic. Um, in the course of reading this book, there were so many moments where um, I felt like I was there because you were talking about places and moments that I've also experienced. Um, and I, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about the connective tissue of you and me and, and so many other um, members of the Iranian diaspora of a certain age. Um, you and I are both uh, contemporaries. Um, and, um, you know, my, my parents um, met at San Francisco State University uh, in the early 60s, around the time that your mom uh, had come from Iran. She was a little bit younger than my dad. Um, but I imagine that at some point that, that these people cross paths. Uh, and it's, it's quite possible uh, that they did in those early years. And um, you know, when I think about all of the different things that have happened in the history of um, US-Iran relations, there are the stories that we know about mm -hmm. because they're headlines. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are stories that were maybe headlines at the time that have been forgotten uh, that, um, that bind us together. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think there's a, there's a lovely point towards the um, end of the second part of the, the book where your family um, is back together in the United States, your mom, your aunts, your uncles, you're a small child, uh, but this realization that you know the political differences, I'm reading between the lines here, uh, but are not as strong as the familial bonds. And you know, mm -hmm. folks found themselves in this new country. Um, I wonder if we could kind of unspool that a little bit and, and you know, I, I, I think about um, a scene in the book uh, where your parents were involved in a, uh, a demonstration, a strike, a, a, what do you call it, at the, at the consulate in San Francisco. What's the term for what happened uh, there? I think we can call it a takeover. I think takeover. we can call it a takeover. <laughs> they took uh, over the consulate. <laughs> yeah. um, talk about that a little bit, because, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an episode that I, 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 I recently learned about. Um, I, I, you know, I think most Americans don't even realize that, that the Iranian uh, government under the Shah had such a big presence in the United States that there were consulates all over the place. That was just one of many. Yeah, and it was a beautiful consulate. I went to San Francisco and, and actually saw it just to, you know, you never know what you're gonna find when you're, when you're reporting um, how that's gonna yeah. change it. But yeah, so that takeover um, in 1970, um, in June, 1970, um, that came right after, I mean, this was right after uh, Kent State. It was right at the moment where, um, you know, I say in the book, none of this happened in a vacuum. Um, it was a few years after, the big demonstrations in Germany, which were around, um, which were also about the Shah, but they were about, there were students all over Europe and all over Germany had come together in these big protests. Um, and, and so the Iranian student um, movement was kind of looking at and absorbing all these various kind of um, moments that were happening historically or in the news, you know, all the stuff that you would read in the news. And so um, several of, the, the groups, because at this point, let me back up and say, the Iranian student movement didn't grow, wasn't a political organization to begin with. It became political over time. Um, and it was it was more or less anti-Shah for most of its existence. Um, but, but the political groups, the political factions didn't really happen until you know, the late 60s, the early 70s. And one of the, the big kind of moments in Northern California that they decided to do is, is this takeover of the consulate. And the idea was, we will be putting our flag in it. We are, um, 
we kind of mean business. Um, we aren't just about marching. We are about action. We are, you know, as, as, as serious as the Black Panthers, as serious as any anti-war movement, the SDS, you know, anything. So they had about 41 people came together. They piled it into a van early in the morning. Um, and this is after weeks of planning. They went into the consulate and basically, you know, took it over for that's the only way to describe it. Um, they started writing anti shaw slogans with red paint on the walls. They were basically raising a ruckus and they were meant to invite the press to come see so they could give their, their message. Um, the police got there before the press and there's you know a lot of really great news footage about uh, these Iranian students being pulled out into these police vans. And then they were arrested um, and most of them spent about a month in, in jail in San, in San Francisco. So this is an event that it's like a relatively, you know, big deal event, but why it became uh, particularly important is back in Iran, the Shah's government asked the Americans to deport them, deport these students, and the American government refused. And then there was a law that was essentially put into effect that said anyone who was involved in the Confederation, that's another kind of name for the, an umbrella for the Iranian student movement, um, the anti-Shah movement abroad was essentially barred from having their passport removed, um, renewed and effectively exiled. Um, or at the very least, when they went back home, they would face consequences. So all of a sudden you had hundreds, um, if not thousands of Iranian kids, 18, 19, 20 years old, who were, you know, were suddenly in exile, or at least they felt that way. Um, and I think there's good reason to think that that was the case. And for the 41 students, the Chelyak Nafar, they had their names printed in newspapers back home. My parents weren't at the consulate, but they were helping with getting bail money, lawyers. My mom was working with the press because that was kind of her job. Um, so, you know, their names were printed in the press back home and their families were brought in for questioning. It was a really big deal. And this was kind of a real inflection point for the movement where students had to decide whether they were gonna stay in this movement or if they were done with it. And a lot of the people I spoke to were still really hurting about this particular moment, this action, this civil disobedience, this however you want to put it, um, and the the ripple effects even from that one moment were still being felt all these years later. I think it's really um, important. Th there's two points that I want to point out to the uh, audience first. During the 60s and up until the revolution, there were more students from Iran studying in the United States than literally any other country. Yeah. You know, that we're talking tens, if not hundreds of thousands of young people coming from uh, Iran. And, you know, we talk about people being, um, you know, radicals. Uh, I think it's fair to say that, that, you know, your folks were Berkeley radicals, not Islam. Islamic radicals, and you know, so often the the two histories um, have been conflated, right? Um, the the history of of Iranians students protesting um, here in the United States and 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 back in Iran with the the um, the post revolutionary government that still holds power today. Um, but I think that that there was a split, right? That that happened. And a lot of those folks that you talk about that are still hurting, 50 years have gone by and they've never gone home, right? Um, and they're still deeply connected to the culture and to, um, and to the ideals uh, uh, that they fought for at that time. But then other people like your parents decided to go back uh, in the face of real risk. Um, and I'd, I'd love it if you talked about how that's colored your, your, your experience in the world. 
Yeah. I mean, I think my parents felt, I mean, I can't know what they felt, but from what I've heard um, and from what my mother had said, like they went back, my dad in January, my mother in February of 1979 um, with this real optimism and this enthusiasm. And also, you know, I put myself in their position. Here's something that they've worked for. Um, the, they did what was otherwise unthinkable. The Shah, which was backed by the, Iran, the American government, um, who's wealthy and well-established across, you know, um, they were able to, they, as in this collective, leftist, Islamists, the people who didn't, you know, that were in the middle, everybody, you know, kind of that were against them were able to come from outside of the country and then inside the country to uproot this government. Um, and now I think we, with hindsight being what it is, we can look back and say, well, it was inevitable, right? Like the Islamic yeah. Republic was always inevitable, but that wasn't the case. In the early 19, in early 1979, um, you know, there's stories of these these people from um, these students, these young people from America and Europe boarding these planes, you know, shouting um, revolutionary anthems, and it was like a party going over there. And then my mother said, as soon as the plane landed, you could tell you got off on the tarmac. The Islamists went in one direction, the the leftists in the other. Um, and you know the anybody else who didn't have those type of affiliations in another direction, but you would have you know you had a free press suddenly, you had newspapers right. opening every day. There was that euphoria, um, and then I was born you know, literally nine months later. So you know I was a child of that fervor. I think um, my parents also had my mother also when she first went back to Iran, she said that she felt whole. Um, all of a sudden, this was what feeling like she belonged meant. And she was somebody who had grown up in, in California from the time she was 10. And so she had always felt a little bit like a fish out of water in Monterey, um, California, where she grew up. <clears throat> so when I went back to Iran, which I did in 2003, um, I kind of had hoped to have that same feeling. And you and I talked briefly and I, I wondered whether or not, cause I know you started going back then like, oh, maybe we would have passed, crossed paths at that point. Um, but you know, everyone at that point that I knew and I was in my early twenties then, I had heard all these stories about these Iranian Americans that went back to Tehran and suddenly felt, you know, those same things my mother felt. And for me, Iran was a slow burn, you know? Um, yeah. And so, and it was complicated. You know, my um, my parents went back with that enthusiasm, but you know, my mom and I, um, and my aunts and uncles had to escape. Um, my dad was imprisoned and later executed. So were many of his friends. Um, and then the diaspora I grew up with was clearly hurt traumatized by by the fallout of this revolution. Um, and so I went back with very mixed feelings about what this legacy meant for me and where I was in this in this kind of history. It's so fascinating because I think um, there was a moment right in the late 90s and early 2000s when people like you and me um, went back we um, maybe found ourselves, um, uh, let me take that back. Our parents um, probably found themselves on, on different sides of a lot of issues. Um, there, there is another um, passage in the book where you write about, um, about uh, the Shaw visiting Jimmy Carter at the White House and your parents' role that day. My father was a Persian rug merchant in San Francisco and the consulate contacted him and said, you know, can you round up a group of friends, Iranians, Americans, whoever, and, you know, we'll pay for uh, the entire group to, to come to Washington to welcome to the Shah to the White House. Um, and my mom, who, whose name I see uh, on this Zoom call right now, uh, 
tells incredible stories of, of that day and, and the mayhem and the surprise, right? And my dad had a younger sister who was uh, in high school in Marin County at that point, um, who, you know, was saying, hey, big brother, don't go. You know, I'm hearing through, from the other kids in school that there's going to be these big, you know, protests and riots. Um, and I think, you know, the, that, um, that, that, that moment in 1979 uh, which was big news at the time. I mean, the 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 Rose Garden was tear gas, yes. right? <laughs> yeah. um, you know, should have been much more of a warning sign to not only you know American leaders but um, Iranian ones as well about what was to come. Yeah. Um, I I want to talk about that. Um, journey that you undertook with your mom and uh, your aunts and your uncle, cousin, uh, to escape Iran. Um, you've provided a, um, an account um, that feels very um, visceral, real, you know, dropping the, the blue jacket off the side of the mountain. I mean, I cried when I when I read, you know, you were three, right? I mean, is, is that how old you were? Not even three. I was, a, yeah, I was a few months shy of three. I was- I'm Talk young. about piecing that on, that that history together and, and um, what that took. So that chapter, the escape chapter, probably took um, four years to write. Um, and a lot of that, was taking breaks um, from writing it. But, you know, I'm, other than my mother, everybody else is alive. Um, and so I was lucky enough that people generous with their time and with their memories. And so I spent a long time, days with, at, with people all told, um, trying to figure out the, the timeline because you know, I talk about this in the book, when you're told stories as a child, you kind of accept them kind of without asking, well, how did this work? Or how long did it take? Um, and the, the great fun and, um, of, and privilege of being a journalist is being able to ask people to slow down. Um, but it, it, you're asking a lot of people to ask them to go to this moment that is so hard. Um, they were leaving a country that they thought they would never go back to. And they were leaving in this case, brother, father, uh, husband, um, family that they thought they would never see again. Um, and then there was an open question of whether or not we would survive. So it was this moment that I was asking people to, to sit in and they did it with like really just graciousness and kindness. Um, and then, so I took those, my mother had left about an eight hour interview um, that she did with her sister in the early 90s. So that was like closer to it. Um, and uh, so, and then my, one of the people that was on the journey had happened to keep a journal when she got, uh, when they got to Spain. And, and so she was very generous and, and let me, and shared that journal with me. And so I was able to, I kind of wrote it one way and then went through over and over again, trying to figure out what the details were. And then, you know, I did all the things you do, you double check all the, the, the things that, you know, the two sources, three sources, four sources of people, if everybody sort of remembers it, then it's probably the case. Um, spent a lot of time on Google Maps. <laughs> Um, but I also spent a lot of time reading other people's accounts because that's a smuggling route that, you know, the yeah. Afghan refugees are still using it today. Um, so it's an open smuggling route. There's a lot of images from back in the 1970s and 80s. Um, so I really, I spent many, many hours uh, piecing it together. And then I went to Vaughn in 2018 and I found somebody um, to drive me to the border. Um, so even with all the research I had done and reporting I had done, 
I had still not captured it until I got there. And I was able to see the hotel that we stayed at, or I was able to see the Iranian part of Bonn. I was able to see, um, you know, the, the, what the mountains looked like, but more importantly, like the air in Bonn is it whips all the moisture out of you. So mm -hmm. there was stuff like that, where you can really understand what it means to be running from a place. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the only thing I remember is the, is the, is losing my jacket. Um, that was, it's <laughs> one of my great sorrows. Look, I mean, it hit me hard and I wasn't there. <laughs> um, I, I also love the technique that you used um, after that, where you interviewed your, your uncle and how you, um, how you juxtapose his version of events, right, with, with your mom's. I mean, I think it, it just, it, it sort of, you've just explained how you went about doing it, but you also show it to us on the page, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and um, there's no reason th that one would uh, question your authority about your own life story, but you're, you're bringing layers of journalistic and, and biographical writing credibility to it um, and showing the reader behind the scenes. So I think anybody who is interested in this form needs to read this book. I, I don't, I've never read a book that's set up in this way. And, um, you know, the way that I'm explaining it might make it sound a bit jarring, but it's not. It's, it's a seamless experience. And, um, and I just wanted to take a minute and applaud you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, that, that moment that you mentioned um, with one of the reasons I felt like it was really important to put that in is because I also wanted to be really mindful of the fact that these are, so many people shared their stories with me and yeah. each one of them had this really beautiful way of looking at what, what was happening. Um, and, and sometimes, um, I don't know, that it just felt really important to kind of acknowledge both true things at once. Yeah. Um, yeah. Talk about that. Talk about this experience in a bigger picture of the Iranian diaspora, you know, in America and beyond. I mean, we are millions of people, right? And um, we arrived here in uh, different circumstances. Uh, some of us were born here, um, but you know, the, the the what's the through line, right? I mean, because there's there's clearly one. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I don't know if I would have been able to explain this as I was writing it because it just, but now in hindsight and knowing how much, one of the things that I really struggled with is who has the right to tell whose story? Like who gets to tell these stories? Um, and is, do I have a right to do to it? Do, is this my story, you know, or is it my uncle's story or is it my aunt's story, is it my mother's story? And then where do they all intersect? And so <clears throat> I think talking about the diaspora, I think there's, you know, one of the things that feels, especially now when we have so many, <laughs> such a, like an explosion of diaspora around the world. Um, what I feel very strongly about is I want a di I want a diversity of story. And I think with the Iranian diaspora, one of the things that I think like we, we have talked about is there's been such a pain in the fissure between Iran and you know all of us. There has been for lots of reasons, whether it's exile or having to flee or you know choosing to leave. Um, for whatever reason, there's a fissure between where we've come, our ancient homeland and where we are now. Um, and like other diaspora, we don't get, mo many of us don't get the luxury of going back and forth and being able to assimilate and integrate our historic past with, with, our, with our present. And I don't think we get to tell that story. That story doesn't get to be told by us. For some reason, it's told. we're told over and over again that maybe 
maybe it's not interesting. And I think that this book is hopefully a primal scream that our stories matter in all of their complexity and in in all of their diversity. And I think, you know, I don't know if anybody is going to read it, but that is, that does feel to me what it is in the end of the day is that we, um, we are, we are a strong and diverse country, Iranians, and we are a strong and diverse diaspora. And, and I'm, I feel very proud to be part of it. And, and yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, it certainly does. And I think, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. Um, for a long time, Iranian Americans complained that um, we weren't represented in media in a reflective way that um, has, uh, you know, shown us in, in, in our multitudes, right, with any kind of nuance. But you and I, and, you know, tons of other people that we both know are have kind of rejected that and decided, oh, okay, you know what, we're going to go out there and, and tell the story ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, the, the, you know, information consuming public is better off for it. Um, so. You know, so. it's, it's just, it's, 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 it's good to see more um, Iranian Americans, but also other hyphenated Americans going back and, and, covering the places that they um, know. Not that, you know, uh, non-Iranians can't cover Iran. That's not what I'm saying. But, you know, there is something that we can bring to this that um, that someone who isn't steeped in it probably can't. Mm. Um, I'd love it if we talk, we don't have a ton of time before we take questions, but I'd like to know, um, what that experience of going back to Iran after all this time, after all this loss, after your father was executed there, um, after growing up with these stories, um, and now with almost 20 years of retrospect since, since you were there, um, what does that chapter mean in your life? Uh, I mean, you know, I, I think I left Iran thinking that I would go back. Um, eventually, one day I would go back. And then I became a journalist. And that slowly over the years, um, just felt like that door closed. Um, like I said, Iran was a slow burn for me. I'm, I write, I was lucky enough that I wrote you know, that was back when we did long emails. I wrote long emails back. Um, and my, you know, I was able to explore the country um, on both sides of my family. Um, I couldn't believe how close I could get to Evin, which like still blows my mind. Um, I, I learned, you know, the thing I, I told someone, my mom and I going back to Iran both set us on our course um, mm -hmm. for for the rest of our lives, and I think that was inc that was certainly true for my mother. Um, and I didn't realize how true that was for me because when I left Iran, um, I'd been there for about six months, maybe. Um, I left with this idea that I have a story to tell. Um, and I don't know how to tell it and I don't know quite what it is, but I know I have a story to tell and I need to figure out how one goes about telling stories. Um, and so that was very clear in the back of my head. Um, and then the other thing, so that kind of set me, I always knew I wanted to be a writer, but that definitely set me on the course to be a journalist um, and, and a storyteller. But one of the things that also happened while I was there is I was forced over and over again to decide who gets to tell me I'm Iranian and who gets to tell me I'm American. And I kind of decided that um, I get to tell. I, okay. that, that's, a, that's an identity I get to claim for myself. Nobody else can do that for me. Um, and so that, that journey of being told 
you aren't Iranian when I was there and you aren't fully American when I was here, I was able to, I think that trip was integrating it. I got to meet my family where they were like in this really beautiful way. Um, I got to explore the country and really love it. Um, and I got to feel incredibly uncomfortable while I was there. Yeah, yeah, I know all those feelings. Uh, <laughs> uh, for better or worse, I, um, yeah, I, I don't remember how many times I was asked the question, um, which one's better, Iran or America? And uh, um, I don't know. I think everybody's got to make that decision for themselves. Right. I always said they were reflections. They were mirror images of each other. They were yeah. so much alike. I, um, I pulled up one other thing that, that really jumped out at me. Um, there's this incredible um, scene where there's a, an earthquake and um, you, you magically are not in the, the place that you should have been um, as a small child. And your mom says, I know about luck, my mother said. I've had good luck and I've had bad luck. I've had them both. And, you know, this to me, you know, it just spoke to, to uh, in very simple way to my experience. And I think yours probably, um, for better or worse, there's a lot of uh, very bitter memories and experiences. Um, but ultimately, I feel like if nothing else, I've won the lottery of life experience. Um, and the older I get, you know, the more that that resonates. Yeah, no, I feel you. It's a weird lottery to win. Yeah. I mean, not the one that, that you signed up for, but you know, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting the first question. I think it's time to move over to, to the audience questions. Um, not sure I understand it uh, completely, but can we address the issue of the place, and I think we mean Iran here, as a power, but also as a literalism? Hmm. Um, I wonder if the person can can maybe expand a little bit. Yeah, can you give, give us a little expansion? Iran is a mystical place ah. uh, and as a real place, right? The, yeah. the juxtaposition of these two things. Uh, it's a great question. Yeah, I mean, I'm very curious, Jason, what you have to say about that. I mean, that automatically, as soon as you said mystical place or I automatically thought of Yazd, um, mm. which is an ancient city in Iran. It was one of my favorite places, um, just extraordinary. And I have this memory of being there and having the sun setting and just the, what they call the Towers of Silence, um, which is a Zoroastrian thing and watching all these dozens and dozens of young boys on these motorbikes. And as the sun is, I mean, it's just such a like, surreal moment and it's beautiful. Um, but there are these moments and I think that speaks to it. You have this real um, beautiful, complicated, diverse country um, that I don't think I, I haven't been there in almost 20 years. Like I can't, you know, do it justice, um, but it is, but it's either vilified mm -hmm. or it's made magic in a way that I, I kind of also push back against. Um, so I think like the realness comes from, I remember when I got, when I moved back to the States, I moved to New York City almost immediately. And one of the things that I said to someone was in Iran, life happens behind closed doors, um, in people's apartments, in a bog, in a garden or something, everything happens where no one else can see it because it's dangerous. In New York and Manhattan, everything happens sort of outside because everyone's apartments are too small. Um, 
so that's kind of I don't know uh, Jason do you have more do you actually have a yeah more? look I mean I think that it's it's just it's such a I've been fortunate to travel to several dozen countries and Iran is one of two or three that when you're there you couldn't be anywhere else <laughs> right yeah you know that's so you're, that's great you're there and it's in you too um um and I think that the the interplay between old and new I mean you know if you drive between any of the major cities um you know just a few miles out past the the uh the the sort of signs of modern civilization you just look to your right or your left and there's going to be an adobe structure from 2000 years ago it's just there right like it's just been there and there's shepherds and um you know uh you feel like you're 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 walking in the past but at the same time um it's ultra modern and Iranians are striving to be as modern um, as anyone. Um, and I think, you know, I don't want to romanticize it, right? Um, it's just a very real place, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, I think that's, I think that note of you, once you're there, you can't be anywhere else. I think that's like an absolutely, accurate thing and it's a country that is maybe it's a culture both full of contradictions that yeah. I find yeah it's that text that feeling of like you can almost get it and then it sort of, sort of slips out of your fingers so, so there is another question here this is for both of us okay. uh do you both retain a dream of returning to Iran and living there and perhaps remaking it Oof. Jason, this might be more complicated for you. Uh, <laughs> um, I would, I really want to go back. I mean, I would love, I, I think it's, it's very unfair that it doesn't feel safe for me to go back. Um, I, want to, I want my son to be able to go to Iran. I would like to go to Iran. I have family there, I want to see them. Um, but I also want to see the country. I, I want to travel. Um, there was a time, I don't ever want to say that I would never move back there, but as of right now, I just don't see how that happens. Yeah, I don't see how it happens for me either. Um, I think I, after it's six years now since I've been released from prison and, and came back, um, the regime there still has a pretty elaborate propaganda campaign against me. So I don't think I'd be particularly safe uh, in Iran, maybe even never, but I do believe that I'll go back someday. Um, I don't think it's my job to, to remake it. Um, I think that the folks who've been living there and struggling for a very long time um, will be tasked with, with that. Um, but I, I, I'm finally at this point now where I really miss it. And um, that wasn't true for the first few years uh, after my release. Yeah, I have so many questions about that. Yeah, <laughs> right to the bone. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, do we have more? I'm visualizing a microphone being passed around the internet. Uh, uh, what to you is the essence of Iranian as an identity? Um, gosh, I don't know how you um, distill what it means to be Iranian into an essence. I guess I want to talk about food, but that's that seems like reductive. It's it's more. Um, you know, when I think about what it means to be Iranian, the things that kind of like catch phrases, the words that come up is this idea of poetry, this idea of connection, um, of art, um, like I said, contradiction, um, 
there is this, what I've, what I've kind of come to understand is that joy is kind of something that you do wherever you are. Like I've never, I, I think even in your lowest, hardest moments, you can find sometimes something that's just yours that you can be joyful about. And I think that's very much an Iranian thing. Um, it's not the same thing as optimism and it's not the mm -hmm. same thing as um, being happy, but that gratitude and that um, expecting joy. That I don't, I think that you expect to feel joy if, if you're Iranian. I, I think that's, that makes a lot of sense to me. I also think that um, when when we are living up to our best selves, uh, savoring small things. Yeah. Um, um, not not every Iranian I know is capable of doing that, but uh, you know, many are. And um, you know, uh, an attention to detail, um, ingenuity cleverness um, and um, a, a unique sense of wit I mean you know yeah. the what your what your mom said about luck uh, I could completely imagine my dad saying something similar I mean he um, you know was 20 when he came to America his he spoke good English uh, but he always had a you know a very thick accent he wasn't a big reader or anything but you know he had a great memory and he would say things like the grass is greener over there <laughs> you know? which makes sense <laughs> um what's the distinct advantage of the iranian american perspective as versus other hyphenations mm. um i think in the book what i feel like we we don't give ourselves Iranian Americans enough credit for it, is most of us are not all of us but there's a good number of us who, whose lives have generationally spanned the relationship between Iran and the US um, and so I think that we bring this personal um, kind of view into what is a geopolitical what is like a geopolitical story in some ways. Um, and I think it's one of those things where you can, um, I don't know if everybody grew up hearing this, but that, you know, the Iranian revolution came out of nowhere and now, you know, it's crazy. Where did this even happen from? But for most of us, you can just think about, you know, your own experience through your family or through stories. And you can tell that this was something that was brewing all along. Um, and so that's one thing. Um, I do think that being able to, um, I mean, Iran being vilified, like I said, or being ex made exotic are two things that aren't particularly helpful. Um, and I think being an Iranian American, you automatically make it a more complicated um, relationship, which I think is helpful. I think that that only serves. I can't hear you. Oh no, Jason. I'm back. Sorry okay. about that. Um, I think we have time for a couple more if if, uh, if anybody else has any questions. Um, I um, I, I, you know, I, I think we're still kind of figuring out who we are as as hyphenated um, Iranian Americans. Have you seen the work of uh, the, uh, I think it's called the Collective of Black Iranians? Yes, I love it. And you know, I think it's just so wonderful that, that um, other groups are now starting to kind of um, forcefully, in a way, kind of push themselves forward and say, here we are, don't, don't forget about us. And I think for me, one of the things that uh, going to Iran taught me was that there are there are so many different kinds of people there, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't mean there are you know 
uh, you know, Shia Iranians and Jewish Iranians and Sunni Iranians and gay Iranians. I mean, there are people of different ethnicities, different colors, different, you know, histories. Um, and that's, that's, uh, that's a reality. Um, somebody wants to know if we can address the anti-Semitism of Iran. I mean, um, yeah, yes, I, you know, the government is sort of famously anti-Semitic. Um, uh, I think there is a real history of, of that. Um, and I, I think that was true under the Shah as well. Um, you know, it's, and having said that, there is a long and storied history of Iranian Jewish people. Um, so I don't, I don't know that I'm fully qualified to speak to it at more than that, um, but. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it, it is a complicated history. Jews have been part of uh, that part of the world and Iran specifically, as long as we've had monotheistic religions. Um, I think the anti-Semitism of the state is one thing. I, I will say that, you know, um, one of the things that has often disappointed me uh, as a member of the Iranian uh, diaspora is um, some of the ingrained racism and prejudices that have been carried over with people. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I like to think that that a lot of that in this this generation and in our little boys generation uh, is starting to um, to get diluted. Um, and I see that you know we live here in Washington D.C. and um, I know a lot of Iranian Americans involved in all sorts of issues, including social justice issues. And I think that that's probably the, the clearest path to um, uh, undoing prejudice and, and, and racism from, from a community is getting involved in those kinds of issues. Yeah, and making space, I think, for, like you said, groups like uh, the collective for Black Iranians and um, groups claiming their space. And I think the rest of us moving over and giving space to claim it, I think is the least we can do. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, it sounds obvious because it is, but you know, we don't say it out loud enough. Yeah, for sure. Um, maybe time for one or two more. Okay. Jake, can you hear me? Hello, Aviva, how are you? I'm gonna take the privilege of having known Neda's parents and if I can do this without crying. Um, years ago, I was a legal observer for that great event, uh, uh, protesting the Shah in Washington at the White House. And that's when I got involved with the Iranian student movement. Neda, I've gotten through half the book. I just finished a film, so I didn't have time to read before. You know, one thing that's interesting is I didn't realize how many secret political work was going on. So it's now decades later, I'm finding out. But you really have captured their, their spirit, their devotion. And I think people should know that I don't think there's ever been any student movement like the Iranian student movement. I tried once to get funding for it. So if there's anyone out there, please try to make a film of it based a lot on Netta's work. And most of all, I just wanna say how proud they would be of you. And, you know, I'm just now going back after my mother was a Holocaust survivor and passed away and my uncle and going back and telling their story and this responsibility of second generation, especially after the trauma our parents have gone through, mm -hmm. you've just done an excellent job. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, maybe one day, Jason, one of your children will be, you know, writing up your stuff, but you know, it really is uh, inspirational and I'm just so proud of you. Oh, thank you, Aviva. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. I couldn't figure out how to say this in the chat. I'm, I'm a little challenged by computers, but thank you for indulging me. And tell everyone, tell everyone to buy the book. <laughs> it's right here. I was gonna do that. I wanted to do that again. Um,
They said they wanted revolution by Neda to Louis Semnani. Um, it's a it's a fantastic book. Try and buy it from an independent bookstore if you can. I work for the Washington Post, which is owned by Jeff Bezos, uh, who I think you know, you know owns another bookseller. But um, I'm going to recommend that you buy them from from an independent one if you can. Um, we always appreciate that. Um, Thad, can you tell us how we're going to take this home? Wait, wait. I just want to also say everyone listen to Jason's podcast. I binged it this weekend. I cried in a little ball. It was so good. You can listen to it on Spotify if you're interested. Um, there's be. a lot of um there's a lot of details i think uh as there are and they wanted revolution they said they wanted revolution um i want to say a thank you to uh to shelby white and uh and and thanks to the center for putting them on thank you netta for asking me to be a part of this uh and i hope that we can do this again in person uh with all of you sometime very soon have a wonderful evening thank you